Dear Ksenia, I would like to ask you about the nature of revelations in religion. For instance, about the Holy Fathers or Apostles who receive revelations, as claimed in religious texts. Did they actually have revelations, or were these texts tampered with, as we would say today? It would be particularly interesting to hear about the revelation of St. John the Theologian, the Apocalypse. And if the saints do receive revelations, and this is non-fiction, where do these revelations come from? From the religious egregor or directly from Yahweh himself? That being said, I'm interested in the technical part of the question. It seems like everything is about religion today. See how nervous it is, this system? It is an interesting topic. Let's try to figure it out. Many people receive revelations, but the Christian Church, as well as the whole religious system, recognizes revelations as acceptable and pleasing to God only if it comes from those saints, elders, clerics, and many others whose consciousness got integrated into the system totally and completely, 100%. It is like an informational channel that extends from one mind towards a greater one, and nothing interrupts this channel. It doesn't branch off, it's a clear, exact, distinctive channel connecting one mind with another. Such a person is reliable. The information that he receives from the Gregorial system will be perceived by him without any distortions, with 100% certainty. And since the mental part of his consciousness was raised based on all the holy texts and holy writings, it is most likely that he will reveal this information using the terminology accepted by this cult. That's why such revelations are usually treated with respect and reverence, whereas different stories told by fortune tellers, psychics, clairvoyants, during channelings and many others that are not included in this system are considered devilish and consequently wrong and not subject to review by definition. That's why all elders, saints and others with their revelations are praised to the sky while all the rest are being dragged through the mud. Now, regarding whom does it come from? Revelations coming from Yahweh directly can be received either by church hierarchs or by righteous Hebrews, since this system doesn't communicate with anyone else. This informational channel is not very powerful by design, so it could only work with the chosen ones, chosen by him, of course, and not in general whereas all others would receive it through associated structures, such as the Christian egregor in its three major denominations, and through a wide variety of different sub-sectoral formations. Therefore, when we talk about Christian elders, we most likely mean Christian apologists who give out prophecies filtered through the Christian environment through the semantic content of Christianity. Whereas the higher hierarchies, those who are called apostles, receive them directly from Jehovah's channel. The higher the hierarchy, either on the ecclesiastical level or the level of power, shrine, angels, archangels, the more likely it proceeds directly from the key point, directly from Yahweh himself. Now, when it comes to St. John the Theologian, to a greater extent, of course, he was an egocentric, meaning he was integrated into Yahweh's channel. And was receiving information from there. This whole story, revolving around the 22nd Arcana and Judaism itself, is based on Babylonian legends, mainly Babylonian legends, and it mostly consists of ancient Sumerian stories that have become generally accessible to us already. And we can see who plagiarized what and from where. As for the visions of John the Theologian, they are also connected to Babylonian legends that tell us about the battle of Tiamat and Marduk. 
They were just slightly distorted to fit the modern day, the time when this story was written. Just how we would now describe, I don't know, the Great Flood, for example. How we would describe any other story that has a certain connotation in the Holy Scripture and we would alter it completely to fit the modern way. As for John the theologian, that's exactly what happened. There were very ancient legends passed on by the word of mouth describing the battle of the gods, the way it would happen, when the end of times would come, what the enemy of gods or gods look like, what could be considered an omen, and so on. And all of this passed through the inflamed consciousness of a Hebrew, took on precisely these forms. Then it was written and rewritten 20,000 times. Are you asking if you should take this whole thing literally? Of course not. You shouldn't take anything literally. These are all metaphors. This monster with seven heads and ten horns or who knows how many, you can basically find it anywhere and see anything you want behind this form. Just like a maiden sitting high on its back can appear before you in an entirely different form, as well as the scribe mark of the beast and so on and so forth. If only this information hadn't been pumped with energy for 2,000 years. Now, the apocalypse is a separate egregor that works independently. It was overfilled with fears, dread and interpretations. It consumed an incredible amount of time of those who thought about it for the past 2,000 years. Since studying theology was considered prestigious during Christianity and the Middle Ages, just like in the Russian Empire where each nobleman had to be military and each peasant had to serve as a recruit for 25 years, just like it was considered proper to graduate from a Jesuit school, attend religious classes at the university for some time, study theology and waste 20-something years on it. Only then one could say that you are a real nobleman, a proper nobleman, the one who can be trusted with ruling a duchy, principality, kingdom, or the whole country. Since you are so proper, so good, since you are an inside man. The topic of the apocalypse and the last days, with all its vivid details described there, finding itself in a consciousness mutilated by permanent celibacy, constant malnutrition, ergot, and all kinds of fun stuff, caused some serious hallucinations in monks and clerics who would study these texts and produced related images, which they didn't keep to themselves, but rather poured out on paper. And all of this gained so much informational density that now we can say, yes, the apocalypse does exist. And it's not just a book, but a whole system. And since it exists in informational space, it will also have to manifest itself into reality. How will it manifest itself in reality? In each head, in its own way, depending on the degree of one's individual inclusion into this system. That is how it will manifest itself. Everyone will surely see its projections, echoes and imprints. Those who know a lot and can do a lot will see the the Enuma Elish, as well as the Apocalypse, will see the prophecies of the saints and the unholy ones. Someone will see the projection of the fourth technological revolution, of the sixth technological order, or whatever else has been predicted to us before the Great Reset. All of it is there as well. The information must be described. It must assume a complete form. Many must believe in it, fill it with their own fears and emotions, and invest a lot of time in it voluntarily. That is when it becomes a living structure, and that is when it will definitely manifest itself. 
It's not quite a super larva, but rather a super egregor that starts to control the consciousness of the many, forcing them to give more and more energy, more fears and more expectations. And the person's time, as well as his whole life, slowly but surely become connected to this egregor. But a scientist is not an adept. He is not a believer, because he sees everything from an informational point of view from the point of view of science and not from the point of view of faith or from a surf attitude towards this faith. As the same Christian Tertullian once said, I believe because it is absurd. That is, the more absurd it is, the more we believe it. That is an indicator of faith. The expectation of something terrible comes directly from ignorance. Eyes that so wrong, let them weep long. Today we have nothing but quotes. The last one was from Lope de Vega. Therefore, try to contemplate this work, I mean the revelation of St. John the theologian, try to contemplate it in the way any scientist would, for example. And how will he do that? Firstly, we'll find out who wrote it, when he wrote it and why, in what state of consciousness he was when he did it, who paid for it. It is very important to know who financed this work. Then he will try to understand what exactly this inflamed consciousness was trying to show us. He will look through the primary sources, the ones this whole thing was copied from, see what the inflamed mind of the author wanted to tell and untangle this thread, unwind it to the very beginning. When you start to study any system in this way, it transforms into knowledge and ceases to be an astral horror flick. And when you unwind it to the very end, you'll understand right away who profits from it, who benefits from the existence of this super egregor up to today, being able to connect itself at the right time and the right place to the consciousness of many thousands, or maybe even millions of people, in order to have a full right to create a completely different reality based on their energetic and informational density, in the image and likeness of the reality that is described within the informational core of this super egregor. This is what I wanted to tell you about all these different revelations.